Welcome to the ninth meeting of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone to turn off their mobile phones uh, and other devices to silent mode as it does interfere with the recording equipment. We have received an apology from Mark Griffins, who hopefully will be here shortly, but unfortunately due to travel difficulties. So set Mark's apologies on that one. Uh, first turn to agenda item one. Uh, that is taking decision in private. Um, basically, we will be hearing evidence and we decided to, whether we take agenda item four, consideration of evidence here today in private. Is the committee content to take that evidence in private? Thank you. Agenda item two, presentation of Sheffield Hallam research. In June, the committee agreed to commission Sheffield Hallam University to conduct follow-up research on the impact of welfare reform. The report was published earlier this month, and today is our opportunity to consider the report formally. Can I formally welcome Professor Steve Foringill from the Centre for Regional Economic and Social Research, Sheffield Hallam University, and can I invite you, Professor, to give your presentation? Thank you, Sandra, and uh, good morning, colleagues. Um, this is very much a joint piece of, uh, <coughs> piece of work that I'm presenting, by the way, as you can see. Um, it's uh, been an effort by myself and my close colleague, uh, Christina uh, Beattie. Uh, this is actually um, certainly not the first time that um, I've been up here giving evidence um, on the welfare reforms. Um, myself and Tina Beattie actually did four reports um, for this committee's immediate predecessor, the, uh, the Welfare uh, Reform uh, Committee. Um, back in 2013, we, um, we documented uh, the expected impact of the, the last round of welfare reforms um, on Scotland. Um, that was followed up by a, a report in 2014 that looked at the, the local impact, tracing the impact right down to um, electoral ward level. Uh, a further report on the impact on different types of households. And uh, finally, one in 2015 on... Uh, the impacts on the Scottish labour market. Now, uh, you might wonder why, um, why does the Scottish Parliament keep coming to uh, Sheffield Hallam University uh, for these studies? Um, two reasons, I think. One is we've accumulated a, a tremendous data bank and a lot of methodological expertise in terms of picking apart the regional and local impacts um, of um, uh, of welfare reforms. The other thing is, I've got to say, you've got this work on the cheap because you've been able to uh, 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 piggyback work for Scotland on, on the back of um, really quite substantial research that's been conducted um, across uh, Britain as a whole. So don't get the impression that somehow you've been profligate and have been shoveling money I south think, of the border. I think, Professor, you always know that the Scottish people are quite careful with their money, so maybe, maybe that's it. <laughs> yes. Now, um, just to continue the tradition, in fact, uh, the new report which you've got today is really a, another example of piggybacking a piece of work for Scotland on the back of uh, something that's been done uh, for uh, Britain um, as a whole. Um, uh, the new report is, is really son of a document which we published called The Uneven Impacts of Welfare Reform, The Financial Losses to Places and People. That came out in, in March um, of this year and really was the first attempt to, um, to document in, in, a, in a quantified way the, the impact, the expected impact of the new um, round of um, welfare reforms. What, what you've got today is um, a report which zooms in very specifically on, on Scotland. Um, it, it looks at how much, in terms of pounds and pence, uh, claimants in Scotland can expect to lose um, as a result of the new welfare reforms announced uh, since the May 2015 uh, general election. Um, it looks also uh, down at the local authority level, so there are figures um, uh, documenting the losses for each of the local authorities in Scotland, compares Scotland with um, the rest of, of Great Britain. And I've got to say, all the figures are brand new, absolutely brand new, because um, though we published a report back in, in March, we were then wrong-footed by the Treasury. Uh, we, we published our report, I think, in, 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 in early March, and two weeks later, the, uh, the Chancellor in his budget uh, produced revised estimates of the financial saving that uh, he expected 
from uh, the welfare reforms that it announced the, the previous year in 2015. And that's required us to uh, rejig all our calculations. So the figures I'm presenting today and that are in the new report for Scotland, you won't find in that GB report from March 2016. They're absolutely brand new um, uh, figures. Um, I should say, by the way, that when we, we document the impacts of the welfare reforms, we're not attempting to pass judgment on them. Now, as you might expect, um, someone like myself and my colleague, Tina Beattie, you know, we do have personal views on, on the pros and cons of the welfare reforms. But that's not the point here. The point is to sit back and, and, and very objectively try to document, um, you know, what will be the impact on specific places, in this instance, on, on, on Scotland. Um, our starting point is always the Treasury's own estimates of the financial savings arising from each element of the welfare reform package. Um, and the way, the main way we then move down from the from the national, from the UK scale, down to the, to the local scale, is, is by deploying benefit numbers. We know how many claimants there are of each benefit in each local authority up and down the country. We can get expenditure figures as well. So we begin to translate uh, the national figures down to the local level uh, using uh, all of that uh, claimant number and expenditure uh, data. Um, it sounds very simple, but actually it's a lot more complex than that, and we have to bring to bear uh, quite a lot um, of official, other official data. Uh, for example, from the, the government's own impact assessments, where they might say, for example, that they expect such and such a reform to impact more severely on a certain type of household or a certain place, etc., etc. Uh, that said, um, I've got to underline that it is an imprecise science. Not imprecise because our methods are, are, are somehow flawed, but when we're looking forward and trying to predict what the, um, the impacts of the reforms uh, will be in terms of financial losses, you know, the world is always uncertain. The world never works out quite as you know, the, the, the Chancellor, uh, for example, uh, might expect. Um, and so there can be quite a difference, and I will show you in a minute uh, an example of this. There can be quite a difference between what you anticipate initially to be the, um, the impact of the reforms and what is actually um, the outturn. What we've got to do really is make the best possible assessment at this point in time. Now, let me just take a step backwards here and, and, and move away from the, the new reforms and, and refresh your memories on the, um, the pre-2015 uh, reforms. Um, there was a lot going on that impacted um, on Scotland. Um, I've listed here the, the eight big uh, Westminster instigated changes that led to financial losses uh, up here. Um, just go very quickly through them. Uh, housing benefit changes to local housing allowance, that's about housing benefit for those in the private rented sector. Um, Non-dependent deductions, that was about contributions that which, for example, grown-up children uh, in employment should make towards the housing costs of, uh, of their parents if they're still living at home. The benefit cap, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Uh, the changeover from disability living allowance to personal independence payments. Um, a whole raft of reforms to employment and support allowance or what was incapacity benefit. Mm -hmm. ESA is the new incapacity benefit. Um, some of those reforms came into effect in, in the post-2010 period, but were actually initiated by Labour. But there was an additional um, layer uh, on top of that um, that the coalition government introduced, particularly around means testing uh, of ESA for those in the work-related activity group. Changes to child benefit, um, withdrawal from higher earners, for example. A lot of detailed changes to tax credits, which had the effect of... Um, uh, reducing entitlements and then on top of that we had the the one percent uprating of benefits which certainly the Chancellor intended to be uh, a below inflation uh, uprating. Uh, it didn't quite work out like that um, because inflation slowed down um, a great deal. Um, you might think well aren't there one or two things missing from that list? Uh, yes there, there definitely are. Um, up here in Scotland you managed to avert of course the impact of the, uh, the bedroom tax. Uh, you also managed to avert the impact of um, uh, reductions in council tax support. Now, in both cases, that was an aver a, a version 
of the impact on claimants because it was still a financial loss for the public sector um, up here um, uh, for, for the Scottish Government and for, for local authorities. What was also initiated prior to um, 2015 was, was perhaps the biggest reform of all, which is the change over to universal credit. Um, but what you need to understand about universal credit is it's essentially been a, a repackaging of existing benefits. And it wasn't certainly in its original form intended to actually save money by reducing the entitlement of claimants. Now that's changing. Uh, and, and some of the changes you know, are going to be in the figures uh, that I'm going to uh, show um, in a moment. There are also a number of other uh, detailed changes which I, I won't go into. A lot of people zoom in on sanctions, for example. Sanctions are, were not new, it's just that they were applied a little bit more vigorously, well, quite a lot more vigorously, actually, uh, in the post-2010 uh, period. Um, so just to, let's, let's go back, so let's stick with those pre-2015 reforms and, and, and first off just look at what was expected to be saved um, or taken from claimants up here in Scotland and what is our best estimate of um, what actually was the outturn uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day or rather by March um, of this year. Now back in 2013 when we did that very first report uh, for the Scottish Parliament, for your Welfare Reform Committee, your predecessor committee, <coughs> we estimated that the, uh, the reforms in Scotland uh, would lead to the, uh, the loss of £1,520 million pounds a year um, uh, from claimants' pockets um, up here. Uh, the, the outturn has been very substantially less than that. Uh, we put the figure at uh, £1.1 billion pounds a year. Uh, and you can see you know, which were the big elements and also which elements have resulted in smaller savings than were originally anticipated. And what really stands out from that um, is employment and support allowance, where the anticipated savings have actually been only a, a fraction, um, uh, the outturn savings have been a fraction of what was originally anticipated. Um, now that's not because we got it wrong, it's because the world didn't develop in the way that the government expected. Um, the work capability assessment, for example, which I'm sure you should have all heard of, did not uh, move large numbers off uh, ESA as was expected. And then even for those staying on ESA, a far higher proportion were placed in what's called the support group rather than the work-related activity group. And therefore, when the government, when the Westminster government means tested the, the, the benefits to those in the work-related activity group, it saved far less money because there were far fewer people uh, in that group. Uh, so a, a ma major undershoot in the savings there. And that's had big implications for Scotland because Scotland has very large numbers of adults of working age out of the labour market on employment and support um, allowance. Other things, if you look down that list, um, when we first came here, uh, we anticipated the bedroom tax to be impacting up here. Of course, you averted that. Um, but you can, you can see the broad package. Um, the the up, uprating of, of benefits didn't take as much money, money from people because inflation slowed down, so that, um, in, in effect, that was a, a smaller saving to the exchequer. Um, so that rather underlines that this is a somewhat imprecise science. Anyway, let's move forward now to the, um, to, to the new reforms and just go through what they are um, first. These are, these are the reforms introduced by the Westminster government since uh, the general election in May 2015. Uh, changes to universal credit work allowances, uh, which basically means that the, the threshold at which universal credit is clawed back from claimants as their income rises has been lowered. Now, in fact, the, George Osborne originally was going to introduce that reform to tax credits as well. Um, he got knocked into touch on that one by his own uh, backbenchers. Um, but the same reform is coming in to universal credit. It's already operational, indeed, on universal credit. And, of course, people are gen generally have been moved over from existing benefits onto universal credit. So ultimately, um, it has uh, essentially the same effect, only it's, uh, it's rather uh, delayed. Then there are a whole raft of changes to, to tax credits, of which um, uh, the big ones 
are, are around children. It's about eligibility for you know, the third and fourth child for, for, tax spend, for tax credits. That's going to be removed for births after April of, um, after March of next year. Um, the removal of the family element as well. Mortgage interest support is going to be changed from a welfare payment to a loan. Um, the lo local housing allowance, LHA cap in the social rented sector is, well, that has been applied to the private rented sector will also be applied to the social rented sector. Um, that's going to limit housing benefits entitlement, um, particularly up here in Scotland where you have a large uh, social rented sector. Uh, housing benefit um, for 18, unemployed 18 to 21 year olds is, is coming to an end as an automatic entitlement. Employment and support allowance, back to that old um, uh, hoary chestnut. Uh, the work related activity group, the benefit rate there is getting cut down to the GSA rate. Uh, the benefit cap is being extended. In fact, that extension came into effect, I believe, was it last week or the, or the week before? Very, very recently. It's coming to effect this mo month. It's, it's, it's now set at 20,000 in Scotland. It used to be 26,000. And then finally, we've got the, uh, the, the four-year freeze in the real value of benefits, um, for, in the money value of benefits, which in real terms is going to uh, uh, mean a significant reduction if inflation uh, accelerates. Also, don't forget that one of the big pre-2015 reforms is still trundling along um, into um, the post-2015 era, and that's the changeover from DLA uh, to personal independence payments. Um, that's not anticipated to be completed until 2018, and indeed the existing claimants of, um, of DLA only began to be reassessed from uh, October last year. So that's an ongoing reform uh, from the uh, pre-general election um, period. There are some things too um, that Westminster has introduced that don't apply to Scotland, pay to stay and the um, changes in social sector rents. Right, let's get to uh, the hard numbers in all of this. Um, uh, this is the most complex slide, but unfortunately the most important in the, uh, in the presentation. Um, some of the staff of your committee uh, actually did a rather nice graphic. Um, I can see it, it is in front of you, which, which rather summarises, uh, that's the one in, in pink, which summarises uh, some of this very nicely. Um, let's start off with, with, with the bottom line. How much do we expect to, to be taken from claimants in Scotland by the time, by 2021, when this new round of reforms come to fruition? Well, we expect the annual loss to be a little bit over a billion pounds a year. Um, now, to put that into context, I showed you figures earlier which suggested that the, the rate of loss from the old reforms, the pre-2015 reforms, was about 1.1 billion a year. So if we take the, the decade as a whole, we're looking at, at just over 2 billion a year uh, being taken from claimants, and in effect, the pace of welfare reform is not slowing at all. Um, it, it very, very marginal uh, slowing. Now, look down the first column in terms of, you know, which are the big things and which are the small things. Um, the big financial losses uh, we expect to come from uh, the benefit freeze, uh, the changes to uh, universal credit work allowances, uh, the continuing change from from DLA to personal independence payments and from the cuts to our tax credits. Uh, by comparison, the, uh, uh, the tweaking at the edges to housing benefit for 18 to, to 21 year olds is, is relatively small financial savings. Um, looking at the second and third columns, um, they probably looked at best together because some of these reforms hit very large numbers of people but take modest amounts from them. Whereas other elements of the reform package hit small numbers of people, uh, but take um, uh, quite large amounts uh, from them. Uh, so the benefit freeze, which means that your benefits don't rise with, uh, with inflation, hits very large numbers of households, uh, but the average loss by the time that you get to, um, to 2020 is relatively modest. I think it'll actually still be quite painful. Uh, for many people, but you know, 450 pounds we're, we're estimating there, um, spread across 700,000 um, households. Uh, by comparison, um, the, the extension to the benefit cap 
Um, if you look third from bottom on that list, uh, 11,000 households estimated to be um, impacted uh, here in Scotland, <coughs> but the average loss to each of those households on an annualised basis is, is £2,400. Even 11,000 households may not sound very many, but it's, it's interesting to, to compare that with the pre-2016 uh, benefit cap, uh, where the figures tell us that only 900 households were, were affected by the, uh, uh, the cap. Uh, but that lowering from 26,000 down to 20,000 as the maximum amount um, impacts on, uh, on a great deal uh, more households uh, here uh, in Scotland. Now, we, we can't add up all of those numbers to give, um, you know, to give you a final figure for how many people in total are affected by all these welfare reforms because you need to bear in mind that some, of the, well, that some individuals are affected by more than one element of the reform package. Um, so that if you are um, out of work, sick and disabled, you may be affected by the changes to employment support allowance. You might also be hit by uh, the change over to personal independence payments. If you live in a um, social rented accommodation, you may also find that the, um, the new LHJ uh, cap impacts on you. And you might even find that if you have um, a child and are claiming tax credits for that child, uh, that um, there will be um, uh, a financial loss there. So, you know, each of these changes uh, may impact uh, on, on the same people uh, in, on some occasions. It's important to bear in mind, however, um, just exactly how uh, these uh, reforms do impact on people. And here, I've got to say, the, uh, the Westminster government has... Um, been really quite clever, or perhaps they've been cleverer than they were last time round, because comparatively few people will actually find that their cash payment is reduced from one week to the next. Um, the benefit freeze, for example, is a, is, is a cut in the real value of benefits, not in the cash value. Then there is a whole raft of the reforms which impact not on existing claimants, but on new claimants or claimants with revised claims. So that, for example, the, the work allowances within universal credit, they only come into effect if you are transferred onto uh, universal uh, credit for the first time, or indeed if your circumstances change um, and you have to make a new universal credit um, claim. Uh, likewise, the, the lower ESA payment rates only impact on um, uh, new claimants. The ones that do reduce people's cash payments, you know, from one week to the next are anybody who loses out as a result of that change from DLA to PIP and the lower benefit cap. Yeah, they definitely will reduce or are reducing um, existing uh, payments. Now, how does all of this impact on individual local authorities uh, up and down Scotland? Right, the measure we've used here <coughs> in this particular list is the financial loss averaged across the whole working age population um, in each of the local authorities. So this is, this is the best measure of the intensity of the hit. And the hit is virtually all on working age adults. It barely touches pensioner households. Um, so I think looking at the loss per working age adult um, is, is, is the best measure. Um, in Glasgow, the figure averages £400 per adult of working age. That's not per claimant. It's averaging the financial loss across every adult between the age of 16 and 64 in Glasgow. At the other end of the spectrum in, in Shetland, um, we're estimating the loss is £160 uh, per adult of working age. That doesn't mean to say anybody actually losing money loses less in, Sh in, in, in Shetland than they do in Glasgow. It really is a reflection of the fact that in Glasgow there are far more uh, welfare benefit claimants, far more people in receipt of benefit uh, than there are uh, in Shetland. If you look Along that list, you'll see it's older industrial Scotland that's really in the firing line, line here. You know, Glasgow, Western Berkshire, North Ayrshire, Inverclyde, Dundee, North Lanarkshire. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, it's, it's the, um, 
hitherto prosperous um, oil uh, locations, Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire, Shetland, um, and Edinburgh is um, well towards the prosperous end of the spectrum these days uh, as well. Um, this is a pattern that we've seen before in our earlier studies for the Scottish Parliament, uh, and there's a clear relationship between the, um, the scale of the financial hit, the intensity of the financial hit, and uh, the extent of deprivation. Now, th this is a little diagram that economists <laughs> like to produce. Um, on the vertical scale is, um, is the scale of the, the financial hit in terms of the financial loss per adult of working age. On the horizontal scale, um, from left to right, it's the share of LSOAs, which is basically neighbourhoods, amongst the, the most deprived 20% in Scotland. And um, you know, the level of deprivation goes up as you move from left uh, to right. Each one of those dots is, is, um, is a Scottish local authority. And there's a clear relationship in here that the, um, the higher the level of, of deprivation, uh, the bigger the financial hit uh, from these uh, welfare reforms which is exactly what you ex would expect because you know, a, a deprived area almost by definition has, has quite large numbers um, reliant on uh, welfare uh, benefits. So if you're cutting benefits, it hits the poorest areas uh, hardest. How does Scotland um, compare with um, the rest of, um, of Great Britain? Um, you're more or less on the, uh, on the national average actually fractionally below. Um, but bear in mind that at least one important element of the reform package that impacts in England, and that's the pay-to-stay arrangements where um, well-off, better-off social tenants have to uh, be charged market rents. That doesn't apply up here in Scotland. So that's one of the reasons why uh, you're fairly well down uh, the, uh, the, the rankings. As you can see, these welfare reforms, that, that 12,295 at the bottom, it's the Treasury's, the Treasury's own figure about what they expect to save. Yeah? Um, about, about a billion of that um, uh, here uh, in Scotland. On average, across all adults of working age in Scotland, across all adults between the ages of 16 and 64, the financial loss will work out at about £300 a year by the time that these reforms have all come to fruition, um, which is uh, in 2021. 20, uh, now, before I wrap this up, let me just ask um, a couple of questions. Firstly, will the financial loss be offset? Because I think if you had a Conservative minister here, they would say, ah, well, we, we are cutting welfare benefits, but we're also putting money back into people's pockets through other routes. Um, well, let's just take a, 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 a look at that. Um, certainly, the, the present Westminster government is planning to increase personal tax allowances. Um, and if they deliver on the promise that was published in the summer budget uh, last year, then that increase in personal tax allowances will be worth 300, £380 a year uh, per taxpayer uh, by 2021. Uh, though Let's be fair, it would only be worth probably about half that much if we allow for inflation. But what you do need to bear in mind when you're looking at welfare claimants is that only a proportion of benefit claimants pay tax. And that actually inc even includes you know, some of the people who are in work and claiming benefits. You know, if you are uh, in part-time, low-paid employment, you probably do not earn enough uh, to be paying income tax, so a reduction in the personal, an uh, increase in the personal tax allowance um, is uh, not worth um, very much to you. Then we've got the national um, living wage which has come in. Uh, there is no question at all that, that, um, that, that that's good for the earnings of, um, uh, of low-paid workers, but bear in mind as earnings increase for those in work, uh, benefits are withdrawn as income rises. So there's a bit of an element of, of swings and roundabouts in this. Then there is discretionary housing payments, which are, are on the table to, um, uh, to assist with um, uh, people who hit particular problems in relation to housing benefit entitlement uh, in particular. Um, the, uh, the government has put, the Westminster government has put 
I think it's £800 million on the table for discretionary housing payments, but that's over a five-year period. If you work that through, it only comes down to £15 million a year in Scotland, which in, in relation to the overall uh, welfare uh, cuts is, is, is quite modest. And I would imagine that here in Scotland you've got that pretty much all committed already mm -hmm. to um, offsetting the, uh, uh, the bedroom tax. Um, then there is improved financial support for, for childcare, tax allowances, and I know here in Scotland as well you are going to introduce um, additional free childcare for three and four year olds, uh, and that's helpful. Um, now there's no doubt if you take that package as a whole, some people will have some of what they lose through the welfare cuts offset um, uh, through one or another route there. Um, but. Um, there's no guarantee that the full loss will be offset and sometimes these, these positive uh, changes um, actually will be impacting on people who are not affected by the, uh, the welfare reforms. I mean, the, the childcare changes, uh, for example, may, uh, uh, may simply help people who are in work and not claiming benefit at all. The other question I would ask is, is will more people find work as a result of the, uh, the new welfare reforms? And again, I think if you had a Conservative Minister here, indeed, I think you had the Secretary of State here, didn't you, uh, a couple of weeks ago? Um, no doubt, that I, I expect the Secretary of State uh, would have said that um, the welfare reforms will encourage more people to find work. Um, uh, well, let's just look at that claim. Um, firstly, you do have to remember that in the vast majority of cases, claimants were already financially better off in, in work long before um, all of these welfare reforms. I mean, the, the tweaking at the edges and the new withdrawal rates in universal credit may affect just how much better off they would be. But, you know, it was always the case that the vast majority would be better off in work. Um, and you have to bear in mind that reductions in in-work benefits and that applies to the universal credit work allowances and to tax credits, actually make employment rather less attractive. That's mm -hmm. the perverse effect. Um, bear in mind, too, that the big numbers out of work on, on benefits these days are not on job seekers' allowance. They are on employment and support allowance, the modern-day incapacity benefits. <coughs> That's true across Britain as a whole, and it's particularly true here in, in, in Scotland. Uh, and the barriers to, to getting people on ESA into work are rather more complex than those affecting GSA claimants. I mean, often there are, there are health issues that have to be addressed, addressed as well as issues of, of, of skills and indeed the availability of appropriate employment. Uh, the highest claimant rates are also in the places with the weakest local economies. And I've got to say, going back to our previous work that we did for um, the Welfare Reform Committee, we could find no evidence uh, so far, that was up to 2015, of a positive impact on the Scottish labour market of the last round of, of welfare reforms. So will p more people find work? Hmm. I, uh, I'm sceptical skeptical, um, on that front. To conclude, therefore, um, firstly, bear in mind that the pace of welfare reform is barely slowing. Um, it's my observation, and correct me if I'm wrong, that um, welfare reform has dropped down the news agenda a little bit of late, probably because it's been obscured <coughs> by other things like Brexit, but also because it's seeming like old hat, it's seeming like you know, an issue of 2012 or through 13 rather than 16 and 17. Uh, not true, uh, not true at all. P welfare reform is, is full steam ahead. Um, second point, um, bear in mind that in Scotland, um, as in the rest of Britain, um, we're looking at financial losses both to people in work uh, and out of work, that there will be multiple hits for some households and individuals, and that, once again, it's the poorest places mm -hmm. that are hit hardest. And then finally, and this is a little bit of a plea particularly to, to this committee, um, don't be blinded by the devolution of, of welfare powers. Um, I know there will be a natural tendency um, for this committee to focus on uh, the powers that the Scottish Government does now have over um, welfare issues. Um, and I'm sure that will become a large part of your agenda if it isn't already a large part of your agenda. Um, but Westminster is still the very big player in all of this. Um, and Westminster still has a 
huge impact and is having a huge impact up here in Scotland. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you very much. That was absolutely so interesting. I know we have you here till 10 o'clock. I'd like to sit in the background and oh, listen right, to the professors to as well. Oh, right, that's absolutely great. You're more than welcome to do that. Just want, do you mind taking a couple of questions or delighted. observations? I'd be or, delighted, thank you. Yeah, um, I, I would just like to, you know, what you said before about Westminster having, the, you know, the most, obviously they've still got 85% and we only have 15%. It's always been, not just my case, but others as well, that we'd have been better with 100%. We could have looked at the whole thing, but we are where we are and we have to look at the 15%. I just wanted to ask, I mean, the, the absolute huge jump with the lower benefit cap, uh, basically going from 900 households to 11,000 households in Scotland being affected by that. What knock-on effect do you think that will have on their lives? And even if they are trying to get back into work, certainly not going to help them anyway. Just, just maybe, you know. I, you I, I would imagine that this is going to be a, a rather acute problem um, for, um, for a lot of households. Um, it isn't as if there wasn't a benefit cap even before the government first introduced one of 26,000, you know, and people's benefits were capped on the basis of the, the sum of their entitlements, you know, uh, on, on individual benefits, and they were all worked out in terms, very carefully in terms of, you know, well, what claim have you got from housing, from the number of kids, et cetera, et cetera. There was a cap before. Mm. Uh, we didn't call it a cap, but there was effectively a cap, and it was the sum of everything um, that, that to which they were entitled. Um, you know, as you progressively lower that cap, you know, and it's a big jump down now from 26 to 20,000. Um, you know, these are people who, who, whose benefit already was means tested. In effect, you know, it was it was it was based on um, the, their needs um, and their lack of um, of all other income uh, or the lack of savings. I can only imagine that this one is going to be very very painful. Um, Whereas, in contrast, for example, um, when there were child benefit changes um, in the last uh, Westminster uh, Parliament, I mean, most of that impact fell on higher earners. Yes. And, all oh, right, they might have winced a little bit, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, that was not going to be, um, you know, plunging relatively poor people uh, even further into poverty. But benefit cap extension, whoa. Um, I, I don't know what the feedback on the ground is yet, but I can only imagine that this is going to hurt. Um, yeah, sorry. Thank, thank you so much. Ben, did you want to come in? And followed by <coughs> Thank you, Convener. As well as from a, a social w welfare perspective, I think uh, analysing this from an economic perspective is, is quite interesting. And I, I noted with, with interest the, the points you made about one billion a year coming out of uh, the, the system pre-2015 over two billion a year uh, until 2021. What, what, are you, what are your estimates on, on the, the totality of the, the demand that's going to be taken out of the economy from that, as well as the, the obviously the impact it will have on, on individual claimants and claimants as a collective? Do you have any analysis of that? Well, let's take the GB situation as, as a whole. Um, by the time we get to 2020, we're now estimating that. Um, <coughs> the overall, all, the whole package that's been introduced since 2010 will take 27 billion, 27 billion pounds a year uh, out of um, welfare claimants' pockets. Now, to put that into, into context, that's about one pound in every four that, um, you know, used to be paid to working age benefit claimants. Uh, 27 billion is, um, is, a, is a very large sum in, in macroeconomic terms. It's equivalent um, to about half the public sector financial deficit at, um, at this point in time. Of course, ministers would argue, well, if we didn't take that out money out through welfare cuts, we'd have had to take that money out uh, through other routes to try and, and balance the, uh, the budget uh, or move towards a more balanced budget. You know, so we'd have had £27 billion of tax increases instead of £27 billion of welfare cuts. Well, maybe... But the, you know, the tax increases, if they had happened, would have fallen on different people uh, to, the, to the £27 billion of, um, 
uh, uh, of cuts uh, that um, we're talking about. Um, so in terms of the impact on, on, on the overall dynamics of the na national economy, it depends really as to whether or not, you know, the, the, the financial savings would have been made through other routes. Uh, but, but in itself, that's, that's a lot of money. Um, and it's been taken out of the poorer economies too. So in a poor economy, this is going to add a, a particular vicious downward twist to an already difficult situation. Exactly, and the, the UK government analysis doesn't take into effect potential multiplier effects with the, the demand in those local economies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we, did, we did some very rough and ready um, calculations um, in, in our GB report in terms of the knock-on consequences for job losses. Um, I wouldn't put too much weight on them, but we are talking, you know, significant numbers of thousands um, of, of, of knock-on job losses if you take that spending power out. But of course, you know, you might have had to take that spending power out through tax increases. That's what ministers would argue. Mm -hmm. uh, would you want to come in on that, back in that one, Alison? Yeah, that point, I mean, there seems to be, a, a, you know, an apparent lack of consideration of the impact of local econ on local economies. Um, of these reforms. I mean, the map clearly highlights that. And, you know, uh, you're saying as a general rule, the, most deprived, the more deprived the local authority area, the greater the per capita household hit. I mean, we're going to be looking at some excruciating impacts here, and they do seem to be so localised. And if local people have less money in their pockets, then other businesses and so on are going to be hit. Yeah. Um, I if I'd brought along a GB-wide presentation, I might have been able to show you a lovely map of, of Britain as a whole with, you know, where the impact of, of all of these reforms fall. And, you know, what you're seeing in Scotland in, in this list of, you know, the, the poor areas versus the, the, the more prosperous areas is, is, is writ large across, across Britain as a whole, which um, there, there is a large swathe of southern England outside London um, that's relatively lightly affected by, by, by the reforms. Um, uh, and across Britain as a whole, as in Scotland, it's the poorest local authorities um, that, that, that are hit hardest. Um, that has rather been glossed over by a lot of people as if welfare reform is something, you know, that affects everybody yeah. equally. Well, it do, it do, it's not working out that way. Yeah. It doesn't work out that way. If you cut welfare benefits, you know, welfare claimants are in some places rather than others. They're not sitting in, in Theresa May's constituency or in David Cameron's old constituency. You know, they are, they are, they are sitting in Glasgow or in Liverpool or, 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 or in former mining villages in Yorkshire. Yeah. Um, and it's those places, yeah, that, that are really in the firing line. And as I said, this adds an extra downward twist to, to, um, to the local economies. You know, they're often struggling for other reasons. Um, uh, and suddenly then you're taking more money out. Um, there's an amazing coincidence between the electoral geography of Britain and the impact of, um, mm -hmm. of, of the welfare reforms. You know, the places es escaping from the welfare reforms, or escaping relatively lightly, are the places where the, the co Conservative government in Westminster do, uh, draws its political support from. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is that you find that? Um, Gordon, you wanted to come in? I think, Adam, you <coughs> thank, thank you, Commissioner. Um, you talked about cutting overall value of benefit but not in cash payment. Now, and then you also indicated there's a, a sort of approach in these reforms for those coming new to the system to tend to be the ones who are affected by, I think, lower payments going forward, if I can put it that way. Um, would you agree that it's a better way to work a system or plan a system to do it in that way. So thereby lessening impact on those currently on benefits and allowing people to adjust to a new uh, state of affairs. Um, I think in terms of minimizing the, um, the anger that will be felt on the ground, it probably is actually a more sensitive uh, way, way to handle things. Um, uh, you know, for example, um, the, uh, the, the reductions in tax credits for people <coughs> with large families, if you, if you already have more than two children, then, you know, the new changes will not affect your entitlement. But if you have a third or fourth child after the spring of next year, you won't get the, um, the, uh, the, the benefit that you previously would have got. Um, 
Now, the net effect is at the end of the day going to be the same because this is still a reduction um, in, uh, in what is paid to, um, uh, to households or into individuals. But because you're not, in many instances, reducing the payment from one week to the next or from one month to the next or whatever, then the, the, the pain will probably be felt less. Um, and the anger will, well, no, the pain won't necessarily be felt less, but the ang it will probably not generate the anger um, that, that a straight cash reduction in payments uh, would generate. Having said that, there are some of the changes, you know, particularly around DLA and PIP and the, and the, and the benefit cap that we talked about a moment ago, the, you know, that the will still have that reduction, you know, in cash terms. But it, 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 it is a cleverer way. Uh, it's a way of averting... Um, uh, some of the indignation, but the net effect is it also. not a way of um, lessening what might be considered a negative impact on people? I mean, the way you you phrase it is almost a political statement. You talk about lessening the anger and so forth. I'm talking about the effect, the actual effect on people and how they relate to the system, rather than a political statement attacking the Conservative UK government. I don't, I, I don't think I was trying to attack um, the, the Conservative government. I was trying to actually just explain how the, system, how the system works here. I mean, at the end of the day, it is still a cut, but the way the cut is experienced is, is, is different. Um, and it's implemented in a way that some people won't actually realise that they're getting less now or getting less in future than they would have done if the old system had stayed in place. But they are getting less. Could I just remind members, as I did <clears throat> the other week there as well, that we treat everyone in this committee with dignity and respect. Uh, Adam Tompkins. <coughs> thank you, uh, convener, and thank you, um, Professor, for the um, presentation, which I thought was um, uh, very useful. And but I, the, 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 there was a. Uh, would I be right? Would, I, would it be fair to say that there was a, a difference between the very detailed and very helpful data that you presented and some of the conclusions? Uh, that you suggested, which were altogether, uh, if I may say so, more speculative. And in particular, I just want to test you a little, if I can, on the, um, the conclusion that you've reached that there is no impact on the labour market in, um, as, a, as a consequence of the programme of welfare reform, uh, which has been ongoing since uh, 2010. And I wonder what uh, your you know, wh wh where, where the data is that, un that, that, that underpins that, that, that remark when there are now, as we all know, more jobs in the British economy than ever before, more disabled people in work in the economy than ever before, and more women in work than, than ever before. So how, what is the, you know, what one might say politically, you know, that there is no impact on the, on the labour market, but in terms of hard data, what's the evidence for that claim? All right, we, we, we're going here into the territory that was covered by one of our previous reports to, um, uh, to the Welfare Reform Committee, as, as, as then was the last of the reports, where we did present the data um, on, on all of this. Um, what we found when we looked at the pattern of change in the Scottish labour market um, over the period from 2010 to about 2014, we found that... Um, Claimant unemployment, the numbers on GSA, um, was falling fastest in the areas where the welfare reforms were uh, hitting hardest, which at one level would be consistent with uh, the argument that the welfare reforms are actually um, uh, moving more people into work. But what we also then did, um, we actually looked at other upturns in, in the economy and asked whether the same pattern could be identified at previous points in the economic cycle. Um, and, and what we found was that actually you had the, exactly the same effect going on in other economic upturns, um, uh, even you know, well before the introduction of, um, of welfare reform, um, which made it hard to conclude that um, the improvements in, or certainly the reductions in the numbers on GSA you know, could be attributed to, to, to welfare reform. It was, it's much more an effect, we thought, that uh, when there is an upturn in the, in the economy, it's obviously 
uh, it's easier to bring down the numbers on, on GSA where the numbers are large than in the areas where uh, the numbers on GSA are, are, were fairly small anyway. You know, you can get a, a, a four or five percentage point reduction, you know, where the starting point is, um, is eight or nine percent, but not where the starting point is three percent. Um, uh, so we were therefore sceptical on the basis of the evidence that um, we were able to assemble uh, of, the, of a positive impact um, on, um, on the Scottish labour market. We couldn't discern any clear relationships between the impact of the welfare reforms and changes in numbers on, on employment and support allowance. It was only on GSA where there was some potential evidence, but then when we looked back in time, we thought, no, this goes on every time the, the economy up to, turns up. So, so I, I, that last point, that last bullet point there on that slide is rooted in hard evidence, but the hard evidence is in an earlier report. Is that, it, just to make sure I've understood it, if I may, um, Kavina. So, that you, I mean, I understand. I mean, I spent 25 years as an academic. I understand that you know, proving causes uh, in uh, social science um, uh, is incredibly uh, difficult to yes. do. But we can see, nonetheless, a correlation uh, between uh, welfare reform and, uh, um, and, and, and and employment growth. No, that we couldn't find a, co a correlation with employment growth, but we could find a correlation with the reduction in the numbers on job seekers' allowance, mm. um, which is not, because the number of, number of jobs in any locality is a more complex, uh, is not, not, changes in employment and changes in numbers on, on, on GSA in any one locality are not the same um, because of commuting patterns, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it was looking across the 32 local authorities within Scotland, we could find correlation on, on GSA, changes in GSA. Mm. We also found a very similar correlation with changes in GSA in, um, in previous upturns. Okay. Yeah? Thank you. Can I ask another question? Are there others who want to come in? Uh, Ruth Maguire wants to okay. come in and then George Adam. Ruth? Thanks for your presentation. It was, it was very interesting. Um, depressed but not surprised to see my own area, North Ayrshire, as one of the um, hardest hits. And um, just wanted to, to, to make the point, I guess, that um, that money is coming out of local businesses as well, because people who receive that money locally spend it locally. But the, the, the question that I um, wanted to ask or was interested to hear your reflections on where was the sort of impact on other public services because when there's pressure, although the money's coming out of the welfare, it's putting additional pressure on perhaps local authorities that are having to pick up some of the slack on health. Is there any, um, do you have any data or, or information around that that would let us see that? Unfortunately, my, my, my simple answer is no. I, I, I think there were probably <laughs> plenty of other people, uh, including some of the um, academics who you might be talking to later, who, who have a better handle on, on that knock-on uh, impact. And some of the agencies on the ground uh, um, will have um, as well. Um, you know, but I suppose you know, one would assume that if the financial losses are, are bigger in some places than others, then the implications you know, for local services um, are going to be bigger in those places. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. George Adams. Thank you. Good morning, it's very interesting. Now, I was actually interested uh, with what you said right towards the end of, interested in your whole presentation, Professor, but the, particularly the bit at the end where you said, don't be blinded by the devolution of powers. Westminster's still a very big player, you know, and that to me kind of, is quite an interesting point when we're going forward because you also said in the report the devolution of welfare powers should not obscure the continuing dominant role that the UK government plays in determining welfare spending in Scotland. And is it not the case that when you look at PIP and other ones, by the time the budget lines actually come to the Scottish government, there's already been such a dramatic change that would it not be the case that if we had, as the convener quite rightly said, we're only getting 15% of the powers, if we had all or more of the powers, we could have a bigger impact in trying to make, uh, kind of make the difference in our local communities, as opposed to just having these ones where the budget seems to be dwindling as time goes on. Um, I don't think it's my role to, to get into the, the merits uh, or, or demerits of, of, of you know, what should or should not be devolved to, um, uh, to Scotland. Um, but I, I, I can confirm what you, you've just said there, that by the time that Scotland does get control of the personal independence payment mm -hmm. budget, it will be smaller mm -hmm. uh, than it is now. 
um, because we are going through a period where um, you know, the, the spending on that particular package of benefits, DLA and, and, and PIP, is still being reduced. And I think, you know, by the time you get the purse strings, it's a smaller purse. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to Mr. Adams? Uh, no, for you, no. Okay. Well, Can I ask a second question there? Because we've still got five minutes left. It's a very well, short question. It's just a, it has just to be a very short question, Mr. Tompkins, indeed. because obviously we've got you to change indeed. over. But you said we had the professor until 10 o'clock. So the, um, the question I wanted to ask, I mean, I, the, the, question, the, the, the statement that you made, which I think is absolutely uh, right, Professor, is that welfare reform is continuing. It's an unfinished business. But it, it, it would also be fair to say, wouldn't it, that it is significantly changing direction under the current Secretary of State in comparison with the, uh, the Secretary of State that started it in Duncan Smith a few uh, years ago. And I wondered if you had time to reflect on the changes that he has signalled recently in the uh, current uh, Green Paper on uh, Improving Lives, the Green Paper jointly published by the DWP and the Department of Health, which picks up directly on a very large number of the claims that you were making in your research about ESA. Um. I'm not sure I could comment in detail on, on, on the changes um, that have occurred, you know, because from one Secretary of State to another. But let's just take the, the green paper on, on work and health, if we could, for a moment. Um, uh, myself and my academic colleagues uh, have done an enormous amount of work, quite separate to, to what you're hearing today, on um, incapacity benefit claimants, as were in you know, the ESA claimants now. Um, I mean, I, we've got work on this extending back over, over 20 years. We have a pretty good handle, I believe, on um, why do we have quite so many people out of the labour market on, on these benefits. And, and just for the uninitiated on this, let me underline the point that across Britain as a whole, we have around about 2.5 million adults of working age out of the labour market on, on ESA, and well, a small number are still on, you know, pre-ESA ESA benefits, but two and a half million on those benefits compared with what is it now on, uh, on uh, uh, unemployment-related benefits. It's not a great deal more than six or 700,000, mm -hmm. is it? Um, now, you look at what is, what is emerging from uh, the Department for Work and Pensions and from the Department of Health on you know, how to go about reducing uh, these numbers. Um, and I've got to say, I don't think their analysis of the cause of the problem is correct. Um, uh, and that is because they don't look down um, at the local geography of where all of these claimants are and don't ask, and don't ask the question, well, why suddenly in these places did we get the emergence of large numbers of adults out of work on incapacity benefits, now, now ESA? Um, so if you go back historically, we didn't have two and a half million on these benefits. If you go back to the, to the late 1970s, the beginning of the, of the 80s, we had about three quarters of a million uh, out of work on, on, on the, the same sorts of benefits. And it isn't that the population has got that much unhealthier. But what becomes transparent when you look down at the local data is that these claimants are concentrated in particular places. And where they are concentrated in particular are Britain's older industrial areas. Mm -hmm. It's not a problem of prosperous southern England. And our research over many years has, has, has suggested that what happens to people with health problems and disabilities is that in the stronger labour markets, in the down south, um, or indeed even, let's say, in the Aberdeen area uh, in, in, in Scotland, the more prosperous areas, that people with health problems and disabilities are able to find work. Um, they're able to stay in work. If they lose their jobs, they can find another job. But in the weaker local labour markets um, of, uh, of, of Britain, um, uh, poor health or disability is one of the great discriminators um, that means that some individuals you know, can't find and retain work and they become marginalized um, and so I think the f what we would say is the fundamental solution to getting the numbers down the numbers on ESA down is to rebuild the economies of um, of the less prosperous parts of the United Kingdom uh, in particular the older industrial areas um, uh, and and 
that does not come through in the diagnosis um, that um, DWP and the Department of Health uh, have of this problem. I think they, they misunderstand the problem. And I don't say that lightly. I really don't say that lightly. Full answer. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you very much. You finished exactly at 10 o'clock with your answer. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know if you were watching the clock or, or not, but thank you very much. You said you wanted to listen to I'd, I'd other... Be, I'd be delighted if I could You're more, back more than welcome. Can I, can I just um, close the session just for a minute or so? Suspend. Suspend the session for a minute or so while there are witnesses there. And thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome everyone. Um, good good morning to uh, our, our next agenda agenda item three. Uh, basically, no, it's not the agenda item three. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's agenda item two. <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank you all for coming along today. I know there's been a bit of problem with transport, etc. <coughs> Excuse me. And I uh, thank you all for being able to make it here today. And also thank her earlier pre pre presentation from uh, Professor Fotheringay, which was absolutely excellent. Uh, actually, we are on agenda item three. I'm reading it from the wrong, wrong end of it. The concluding session of our series of round tables. And obviously, it's to look at the Sheffield Hallam report, basically being a springboard for our discussions. And I do welcome you all today, say the panel of academics, uh, be able to ask you questions. Could I just ask, perhaps starting from, is it Abigail? Perhaps? I can't really see for the light shining on it. Yeah. Abigail, Professor, uh, could you just, from Abigail, round, just introduce yourself and then I'll open it up to questions. I have two specific questions I wanted to ask the panel. Okay, um, I'm Abigail Marks. I'm Professor of Work and Organisation Studies at Harriet Watt and Director of the Centre for Research on Work and Wellbeing. Thank you. Um, I'm Kirsten Rumry. I'm Professor of Social Policy at the University of Stirling and Co-Director of the Centre on Gender and Feminist Studies. Uh, my name is Ken Gibb. I'm Professor of Housing Economics at the University of Glasgow and I'm also the Director of Policy Scotland there too. Thank you. 
I'm Sharon Wright. I'm Senior Lecturer in Public Policy at Glasgow University. I lead the Welfare Reform Network for Policy Scotland and I'm also co-investigator of the ESRC Welfare Conditionality Sanctions Support and Behaviour Change Project. Okay. I'm Paul Spicker. I'm an Emeritus Professor of Robert Gordon University, working as an independent writer and commentator. Okay. I'm Helen Graham. I'm a Research Fellow at the Employment Research Institute at Edinburgh Napier University. Thank you all very much. As I said previously, thank you for making it in today in such a miserable day. And I know that we've had problems with the uh, traffic and um, transport as, as well. There are just two basic questions I wanted to ask the panel. Perhaps uh, give me you know, an answer to them, and then I'll open it up to questions from uh, the members. Uh, first of all, I'm sure you do have, but uh, do you have any comments on the report and its findings? And what do you think the priority should be for this committee over the next five years, the parliamentary session. So I'll open it up to whoever wants to go first. Professor Mark, did you want to? Oh, sorry. I would, well, I broadly, okay. broadly agree Press with the findings of the report. I think, from my research, they're accurate. I think the priority of the committee has to be to try and stop people on ESA getting into further trouble. Um, I mean, as was, as was mentioned, most people on ESA are in um, deprived pre-industrial areas, and a great majority of those are on ESA because of mental health problems. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that the system operates at the moment is taking people further away from the potential to work rather than towards it, because the way the assessment system is, if there are... The majority of those people are also on not DLA or PIP. Mm -hmm. So I think that is the only scope to try and facilitate a way of stabilising people's experiences within those communities. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> yourself, yeah, um, I wanted to comment on the report, um, particularly about the things that are not particularly... This is a bit unfair. The things that are not covered in the report but also have an impact on um, people's lives. Um, we've talked a little bit about the transition from DLA to PIP and the reduction in the budget that will be coming. Um, we do see a, a really uh, an impact in, um, on in health-related um, issues from the actual um, administration of that change. So what we are seeing is um, targets to reduce spend, targets to take people off DLA and and to use the PIP assessment process to reduce expenditure, which is contrary to the kind of form formative aim of the, of the initially of DLA, which was to give people income to offset the cost of disability. Um, and we see this particularly in areas where we, um, uh, the process of going through the claim itself is deleterious to people's health, particularly their mental health and their physical health. Um, but in itself, um, reduction in things like um, mo mobility allowance um, leads to on onset reductions. So, for example, the reduction to um, the ability to access mobility cars, which leads to problems accessing transport. This is all linked to con uh, problems accessing the labour market. And so there's a huge knock-on effect, which is not really recognised, from the transition from DLA to PIP. Now, you may say, oh, we've only got control of 15% of the budget, but you actually have control over the administration of how that budget is actually spent and how it's delivered. And that actually is potentially far more powerful, I think, than this, even this committee realises, because it's actually the administration of the scheme that is causing the most damage to claimants. It's not actually the um, sums of money involved itself. So if we look at, for example, the cost to, cost to claimants um, from benefit sanctions, which um, I think my colleague will probably talk a little bit more about on, on welfare conditionality, the actual cost of losing benefits and then coming back on benefits and the impact that it has, particularly on low-income families, particularly on families that are also claiming DLA, PIP, and have a disabled member or are a carer in the family, is absolutely huge and significant. And the impact on child poverty is also huge and significant. Now, the, it, you can change that by changing the way in which these benefits are administered. You can change that by looking at the cost of outsourcing it to um, 
uh, companies like ATOS and, and, and assessment companies and bringing that back in-house or bringing that back in lower cost. So there are substantial administrative savings that could be made by running things differently and more fairly in Scotland that would then release more money for frontline um, claimants, would release more money uh, we mentioned the additional services, so health and social care services. You have to remember that people who are claiming DLA and PIP are probably also claiming self-directed support and getting um, or um, social care support, particularly. Now, cuts to those benefits have been absolutely substantial, uh, predated welfare reform, but are continuing. And the shift from um, community care services to self-directed support is also happening at the same time in the shift, a sharp reduction in social care budgets that are available to local authorities. Now, again, that is um, uh, an issue that the Scottish government and local authorities have complete control over, have always had complete control over. So, um, in a sense, there is a by joining up systems, by reducing the administrative burden on the way in which systems work, particularly by reducing the impact of sanctions, which all the evidence that I've looked at and the evidence that we've gathered uh, doesn't save money, in fact, costs more than it does to um, save. And if you look at the qualitative impact of sanctions on families at the front line, um, it doesn't help them into work. In fact, it acts as an additional barrier into work for those who are struggling to find work, particularly, as the professor said, on, in those economies where there is not a local labour market that can accommodate people with caring responsibilities, that can accommodate people with disability issues. Um, and we do find that, that, that you know, the evidence also suggests that, that um, building up those economies and getting the economic circumstances right so that employers can accommodate people who perhaps might need to work part-time, who perhaps might need to work uh, with additional supports. All of that is, again, within, you have some of the powers, not necessarily within the Scottish thing. So that would be my sense of the priorities that you need to look at, is the actual functioning of the system and the way in which the system is actually operated in the administration of the system. Mm -hmm. And, and actually you do have substantial powers to make changes there. Thank, thank, thank you so much. Uh, Mr Gibb, is it, we'll just go around as normal then. Thank you. Mr. Thank Gibb. you. Uh, I, first of all, about the report, I think uh, it's a, a model of, cl of clarity. It's uh, a really helpful contribution in that we don't really get that kind of Scottish level or local authority disaggregated kind of analysis. And it, it clearly builds on a body of work. And I thought one of the nice things about it was by, by being able to look at the pre-15 the post-15 work and, and also to make comparisons with GGB as a whole, which is very helpful. I think also it, it nicely sets out what it doesn't do and what it can't do and suggests what the limitations of the data that they're working with are, and that's very helpful. It also poses questions for further research so that we could look at an individual and how an individual you know, has different levels of benefit that, and, and how that impacts on, because we, we can't get that from the data the way that it's uh, uh, pre presented. On the other hand, however, I do think there's a kind of imbalance in the report between this very thorough analysis of the benefit welfare changes and the, the much more kind of less detailed account of the positive changes in terms of tax allowances and such like. And I know that some of that stuff isn't available in the same format and detail, but I think we could, we could in balance have a bit more analysis of, of that, because again, there will be distributional profiles attached to that across space, which would be really interesting to see. And just, just as a kind of minor quibble, I, I think I'm not sure it's safe to say that uh, a proportion of the increase in the personal tax allowance would have happened anyway. I think it's these things are incredibly uncertain and to push forward five years into the future, given the history of the change in the personal tax allowance, which is highly variable and uncertain, I would be slightly more gen generous, I think, about the, you know, the size, the scale of that impact increase. But it's, it's, a, great, it's a great piece, piece of work. Okay. Um, that's right. Um, I'd also like to <clears throat> excuse me, congratulate um, Professor Fothergill and his team for an excellent piece of research, an excellent report. And I think generally the impact of welfare reform in Scotland has got to be the business of this committee. Um, so it's useful in lots of ways. I also agree on the importance of considering um, benefits and services for disabled people, particularly those that are within the remit of the Scottish Parliament. In terms of uh, priorities, I think it would be useful for this committee to consider the impacts on people who are in work as well as those who are out of work, um, because that's going to be a growing area where um, welfare reforms hit 
and also the, uh, I guess, the <clears throat> related um, politics of how that affects people um, is of great relevance. So I, I picked up on a couple of points just when I came in. Sorry, I was late because of the train. Um, there was a point about anger, and uh, that was taken as a, a political criticism. But um, our research, actually, on welfare conditionality um, is a qualitative piece of research, so it actually can speak to that point in more depth. And um, we actually asked people how they were affected by welfare reforms. And what most people told us was that um, the emotional effects were negative, so they included anxiety, depression, uh, health effects, um, even suicide attempts. So um, we did pick up on anger, but we also picked up on a, a lot of different emotional responses that were affecting people in very deep ways in their lives. And I think especially when welfare reform means that people living in poverty have their incomes reduced even further, that is a, an issue of great concern. Um, and what I wanted to highlight was how that's going to continue to impact on people who are in work, especially as those who are out of work. Um, I also agree with uh, Professor Rummery's point about um, the importance of services, and I think it would be good if this committee could look at different options for how services can be uh, run in Scotland, including questioning the uh, the contract and out question and the output payment models that have been common in the rest of the UK. I, I must apologise, Ken, sorry, I didn't know. Did you want to come back in the second part of the question? Sorry. OK, that's absolutely fine. Um, Mrs Spe Speaker. Thank you. The, I would wish to separate out the contents of the report you've just heard from the question of priorities. There is, I fear, a tendency very often to respond to the current set and diet of benefits as a laid table, that always the terms on which benefits are delivered determine what it's possible to think about for the future. And it becomes extremely difficult to adapt to change or to anticipate change because of the huge pressure to make up for what has just gone before. We've seen it in relation to the bedroom tax. I've been asked by politicians in the past, for example, what it might be possible to do in relation to tax credit cuts. I'm afraid that it's not going to be possible to deal with most of the cuts. Um, quite simply, there is too much water coming through the dike. You do not have enough fingers. It cannot work this way. What is, is it is important to do is to look to the future and future priorities about the ways in which benefits are, be, are, are to be delivered in Scotland. And here we've got some very large issues coming at Scotland with a, a great speed of huge importance. The Scottish Government will be taking on responsibility for what is admittedly a minor part of the total social security system, but which nevertheless represents a huge administrative, practical, and financial challenge. That must be the priority for future work over the next five years. In some ways, it's, uh, it, it is a minefield that whatever happens, no matter how well the system is done, we all know that in a large system with multiple iterations dealing with tens or hundreds of thousands of people, whatever can go wrong will go wrong, and the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament will get the blame when it does. We have to accept that as being part of the enterprise which we're engaged in. But clearly it's important to try as far as possible to promote the kind of agenda which the Scottish Parliament has previously adopted relating to respect to dignity, to fairness, to ensure that the system works properly. It's tempting, I know, to focus on specific policies. And that's because a committee like this may well feel, uh, I, sh I should say that I've, I've been a previous advisor to the Welfare Reform Committee, and I, I was aware that this was a strong view held, that they can have far more effect by selecting a small number of topics, focusing on that small number, and seeking to have maximum impact in that way. You have a group of eight academics in, in front of you. I'm fairly sure that each of us could come up with three priorities, and that by the time you finished with the lack of overlap, you would finish with about 30 ideas about what might be taken forward. I think more generally than that, though, we've got to understand that this process 
is already well underway. That it will begin with the smaller benefits, um, that maternity grant will almost certainly be high on the list. I was at a fascinating session yesterday about funeral poverty and the forthcoming patterns of funeral payments. These are, because they're standalone, because they're specific, will be um, developed in the very near future. The disability benefits are clearly the largest part of what is being done financially and in terms of the number of people affected. And that must be addressed in the not too distant future. Now what I would argue for, rather than trying to adapt specific policies on each and everything, is focusing on something which is fundamental to everything, and certainly fundamental to dignity and respect, and that is developing some, a point which, which Kirsten Remory made, among many others, about the administration, about the mechanics of benefit delivery, because without that you can't have the dignity, respect, the coverage, and the and ways to deal with the many pitfalls which you face in the near future. Thank, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, Dr. Graham. Yes, um, well, I would thank Professor Fothergill for a, a forensic analysis of the numbers. It's always nice when uh, someone does the sums that uh, nobody really wants to, to do. Uh, my own perspective on this comes from work um, looking uh, qualitatively at, at welfare reform and the, the impact that that's had on uh, individuals and households. Um, and uh, what, I, what I would say from that is that time is, is really of the essence um, when it comes to PIP. Um, I understand that there is there are there's a motion um, that's been lodged to, to maybe delay um, the implementation of PIP in Scotland, which is all well and good, but this is a group, people on DLA, who have uh, really been in limbo for a long time now. Um, people who were told um, that they would be entitled to DLA for the rest of their lives, um, who... Uh, were then told that they would be subject to reassessment, not being sure what, if, what impact that would have, um, and the implementation has been pushed back and pushed back, and so the period of uncertainty has lengthened for them. And, uh, and as Sharon mentioned, the, the emotional impact of that uncertainty is, 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 uh, is difficult to quantify um, the same way as, as the financial impact, but it, it's undoubtedly having a huge impact. So. Um, yeah, to, to agree really with, with what others have said, look at the, the savings that could be made from joining up um, some of these processes because um, claimants have, have said that they, they're they expected to produce the same um, folder full of evidence for several different purposes. Um, and also um, considering whether it's really necessary to, to reassess people um, at all or certainly to reassess them um, at, at intervals um, when they uh, have a condition that clearly is, is deteriorating. Thank, thank you very much. I'll, I'll open it up to members. Any members to ask a question? Ben McPherson? Oh, yeah. uh, okay, I'll come first. Um, it's a slight uh, digression. Uh, I just would really be interested to get your thoughts initially on the why, in your view, the 15% that has been se uh, selected and allocated for devolution was determined. Do you have any thoughts around the practicalities around that? Um, we heard in, in private evidence session earlier in the week that there was a, a, an understanding that these might be the easiest sections of the social security system to, to devolve, but um, I'd be interested in, in, in any thoughts you might have around that specific point. In, Sorry, in part, because um, I was involved in the Smith Commission, and um, I think in part it does reflect a very strong grassroots feeling from disability organisations within Scotland um, that they wanted to see disability living allowance and carers allowance and associated things uh, devolved to Scotland. And that was actually quite a clear message in amongst all of the very convoluted messages that was coming through the Smith Commission. It was also something that was relatively easy to implement. And in policy terms, that looked like a win-win for everyone. Um, I think in terms of, um, and the political nature of that is actually an opportunity for the Scottish Parliament, no matter what it stands, because if it can prove that it can make these sections of um, benefits work more effectively, more efficiently, and give people dignity and the right to an income and security, which we've heard, I think, across a lot of different um, evidence bases is actually substantially part of the issue, then it, it's proving its competence. And, it, and there are kind of clear guidelines from whichever side of the political divide that you sit that would actually indicate that you could get some relatively 
early wins on that that would indicate that you are handling the budget in a clear and accountable and um, fair way? I'm, I'm very sceptical uh, of the view that the benefits which Scotland has been um, asked to replace are in any sense easy to administer. On the contrary, they seem to me to be deeply convoluted and often seriously problematic. Um, there is, a, a, I think, a common distortion of perspective about benefits, and one of those distortions, irresistibly, that people have is the idea that they are related to the world of work. Well, actually, most benefits aren't. Most benefits relate to the situation of elderly people. And if we actually look at what's happened in relation to this, we see a complete reservation of the national insurance system, uh, which is the least problematic part of the many systems that we have. Um, but we've got things which, um, where we know that there has been a substantial failure of benefit in the past. I'd point particularly to DLA. Now, DLA is, is, is difficult and complex in its own right. But what DWP research on DLA has shown has been that claimants are generally baffled as to the terms on which the benefit is delivered, don't understand why they should claim or why they should not claim. There is extremely poor take up of the care component that, uh, sorry, I, 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 could, I could go on with, with the problems. And effectively, um, Scotland is, uh, is being given as a test the, the task to try to find some way through, um, despite all of those complexities, for a system which I'm, I'm afraid the, the, the current reform to personal independence payment does almost nothing to resolve. I'm just, oh, sorry, Ben, on, on you go. <laughs> just, just on that point, do you uh, share an, an agreement with the, the, the current approach that's been uh, part of the, the Scottish Government's narrative about the fact that the, a safe and secure transition of these devolved benefits is of paramount importance, given the complexity that you, you, you touched on there? I would certainly subscribe to the first part of what you said, which is safe and secure transition. That's clearly essential. It doesn't have to be these benefits. What Scotland has, be, has had devolved are the powers to create benefits and to create benefits for certain purposes. It doesn't follow that the pattern and the structure of benefits must replicate the pattern and structure of the benefits which currently exist. Um, uh, there are, I think, ideas which could be considered. I note, for example, that we are inheriting bo uh, basically not, not only what was DLA and what might be PIP, uh, along with attendance allowance, there's a very strong case for trying to rationalise the relationship between them. Personally, I think that there is a case to go back to, the, to mobility allowance, um, which we used to have as a separate benefit that in addition to that, there are further complications in relation to severe disabled allowance where we've been handed a very small number of residual claims with the task of administering that as well. Uh, I think that there, that there needs to be some form of rationalization which will make it practical for a population which, amongst many other things, is highly dispersed and often very vulnerable. Did you want to come in, Professor? Yep. I just want to come in on, on, on that and, and actually add some evidence to, to the weight of Professor Spicker's um, argument there, in that um, the, the devolution of, of, of these benefits to the Scottish context um, is, in effect, a lump sum that can be reorganised, and this is an absolutely wonderful window of opportunity to do that. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to learn from the mistakes that have been made in setting up these benefits in the first place. And if we focus on DLA and PIP, because that's going to be one of the most um, difficult ones to, to tackle, um, we have to remember that new claimants in Scotland are already claiming PIP. It's, it's not a case that we're inheriting DLA. So they're already going through this assessment process that is highly flawed. And one of the reasons it's flawed is because it is based on a flawed theoretical understanding of what enables people to live independent lives. Um, and that 
flawed theoretical understanding can quite easily be addressed in terms of either redesigning the system or designing a new benefit system with a, a much more up-to-date theoretical understanding that actually reflects what academic evidence is saying, what people on the ground are saying, what grassroots movements are saying. Um, and there is quite a, a collaborative style of policy making already evident within the Scottish Parliament that distinguishes it from the Westminster approach. So there is, you know, whilst this is a difficult task, there is a window of opportunity here to actually create um, a benefit system, particularly for that group of people to, to, uh, who are on DLA and PIP and likely to be on ESA as well. Uh, to, to take a joined up approach to say, you know, what is, it, what is it that actually supports these people to live independently? What is it that actually supports them if they can to access the labour market? And also not to forget the important things around carers um, and that associated thing. What is it that supports carers? Because we absolutely have to be able to rely on carers continuing to care within Scotland. The demographic... Um, tsunami that's coming upon us is, is coming whether we like it or not. So what is it that actually supports carers to be able to continue to care, but also to be able to access the labour market and to be able to work and do other things that enhance their independence, but also lead to economic growth and prosperity? Because at the minute, there are so many, the, the system is so complex and there are so many reasons why it acts as a disincentive and why it actually um, doesn't fulfil the aims of actually enabling people to live dignified lives. Thank you very much. It's, uh, Gordon, who's next? <clears throat> yes, I was particularly interested in comments by Professor Spiker, but others may wish to contribute on this. Um, if we take the basis of the approach to be the dignity and respect um, approach set out by the Scottish Government, um, there's a number of ways of effecting or implementing what is intended, uh, whether it's guidelines or Act of Parliament or statutory instrument, subordinate legislation. Now, uh, as, a, as an advocate working in the courts, and many of my colleagues in the legal profession over the years, like myself, have dealt with people who had uh, entitlement uh, to benefits and who then had to come, unfortunately, to us to make good those entitlements or to take advice on it. Um, some, some, some of the comment that's been made about some of the acts of the Scottish Parliament is that they read like wish lists because they're not specific and what we would call black letter law as lawyers. A bit like saying to a cabinet maker, uh, build a table in this room or a desk, but not giving the cabinet maker the dimensions or the size and then being disappointed with the result. So would you agree that we do need whatever is implemented, anchored in clearly set out statute and subordinate legislation <coughs> so that rights can be made effective uh, when, they, when they're to be implemented and so that those who unfortunately don't receive their entitlement and therefore need to some way of making it good, as it were, can do so. Professor Baker, are you coming in first? I think if, you had if, your if hand I'm, up first. Right, okay. Do you want to come back in again? Um, Whereas I would, I would agree about the importance of specifying the terms and of getting regulations, um, there is, I think, something to make a reservation about, which is that the approach to benefits, which has seen its administration in terms of adversarial legal decisions, has not been to the benefit of the organisation. I think we should want a Scottish Social Security Agency to be what we might call in the jargon a learning organization. One where if there is a need for redress, which there will be, if there is a complaint, that it is possible to take back that information and to improve what the organization does with it. And regrettably, the current state of the benefit system depending on a, an obstacle course of mandatory reconsideration and extremely dif difficult access to judicial, judicial review does not serve this purpose at all. Most local authorities now have complaints procedures where it's possible to get 
complaints fed back to the organization to review the operation to see how it's done. And it seems to me critically important that we do that if we do not want the system simply to replicate the vices of the systems we're taking on. Thank you. Uh, Professor this from both UK-based um, evidence and also international comparative evidence on the interface between, again, it's an area that I know about, so these are the examples I'm drawing on, disability allowance, carer's allowance, and care and support in the community and other services that are intended to support people. We know that what works best um, in terms of supporting people, but also in terms of being relatively easy and fair to administrate, is exactly what you've said, clear rights and entitlements that have a statutory basis, rather than discretionary entitlements, particularly entitlements that are perhaps administered at a local level um, and, and that kind of thing. And if you just look at the examples um, within Scotland of the, the difference between um, having tribunals that can decide on welfare benefits and a really arcane and impenetrable system of appeals against community care assessments and self-directed support, um, having sat on these tribunals myself, um, it is uh, in terms of granting social rights and in terms of actually making the system easier and fairer, it is far better to have a system of nationally set criteria and benefits that is set out in statute. It is open to interpretation, obviously, in terms of, um, but, you know, with all due respect, we don't really want to be fund, uh, you know, funding lawyers when we really should be funding people who are living in poverty and, and struggling. So um, in, in, in effect of uh, you know, having a fairer, more transparent system, a clear set of rights and entitlements that is not locally dependent. So you don't get 32 different systems because you've got 32 different local authorities. Now, again, the Scottish government has the power to create that, to join up budgets, to create clear sets of rights and entitlements, particularly around disability allowances and carers' allowances, etc. So this is, I keep coming back to this, this is a window of opportunity to do that and actually create a system that is clear, accountable and fair because that would be in, in the interests of every, everyone and eventually would actually save quite significant amounts of administrative money as well. Very much. Does anyone else on the panel want to answer? Yeah, I, I want to make a slightly different point because back more to the previous question, but it is re relevant, I think. The 15% the is, a, in a sense, what we know about. The thing that we don't know about, as Paul alluded to, was the, the capacity to create new benefits or top-up benefits. Or, or I think, for me, the most interesting of the lot is the, the, the discretion to amend the existing rules to, 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 to things. It's very hard to put a number or a scale on that, and obviously it's something that will, that will evolve over time. But what I think is really interesting is that we will evolve over this parliament to a situation where uh, Scottish Parliament has much more responsibility for the tax revenue that's being, being raised. Uh, these new welfare powers would have of themselves direct financial implications on the Scottish Parliament budget. So it seems to me that this committee has an opportunity to think really hard about the fundamentals of the choices of what, what would be a priority, given that there would be a, an opportunity cost on the Parliament for an additional benefit, something that you, you really wanted to do to, to make a change. And it's a chance to have a proper debate about that, and I think that's a really exciting opportunity. And because of the discretion and the breadth of it, that could cover all manner of things. My, my area of interest is the, the, the housing cost elements in, in universal credit, the, the 18 to 21 uh, housing benefit uh, uh, exemptions, etc. But there's a whole range of things that could form part of that debate. But it's very so. It's a bit of a red herring to focus so much on 15% because that's such an open part. But for a, a government and a part so interested in justice and respect, etc., it seems to me that there's an opportunity to use some of our existing resources, indeed additional tax revenue, if we're able to generate it to, to make some of those positive changes we want to make. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Wright to that uh, point about the legal aspects and the rights. I mean, my personal opinion is that I think uh, clear rights are really valuable and that that would be a, a helpful way of organising things. My uh, research, my ongoing research on welfare conditionality has looked at processes of appeal and mandatory reconsideration. And what we've mainly found is that um, people find it very difficult to navigate the existing systems. So if the Scottish Social Security Agency could have clear, transparent and independent appeals process that would be really valuable. Um, we found uh, that people who um, 
were undergoing mandatory reconsideration were often mistaken. They thought that was an appeal when it wasn't, and they thought the, what they interpreted as a final decision was something they, in fact, had a right to appeal against. Um, so a simpler system and a more independent system would be useful in that respect for any Scottish um, benefits. Um, there was something else I was going to say. I forgot what it was. Can I just pick up on that? Yeah. Okay. Word simpler. Because <laughs> um, I, I think this, this is important, which is how does one provide a system which is practical, which meets needs? It's quite important that the system should be minimally intrusive. We do have, within current rules and regulations, I'm thinking here of community care legislation, specific reference to somebody's need to have help with having their teeth brushed. Um, we need to think about whether we actually should ever be framing rules of this sort, because rules of that sort require tests that are appropriate to the task. The more we do that, the more intrusive the system becomes, the more likely you are to have failures of take-up and, uh, and further problems. So it's really very important to be prepared to accept that you're going for a more widely spread, less closely specified base than has otherwise been the case. Did you remember, Dr. Wright? <laughs> Something else in response to this. <laughs> okay, on, on you go before I bring in Mr. It, Tompkins. It was just on that point about um, how do you uh, make the decisions without over specifying, but we've got a lot of information. If we're talking here um, in terms of disability and health and, and personal uh, services, there's a lot of information already in existence that's about health and people's health records, and decisions could be made on existing evidence without asking for new tests and without um, asking people to undergo assessments that are actually blunter instruments than the more accurate specialist assessment they've already had. Thank you very much, Adam Tomkins. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry uh, President Tomkins. Could I let in Professor Marks, just for a second? I think the not... issue about assessment is absolutely key. My research has been on people with mental health problems, and every time they go through assessment, their mental health deteriorates. The anticipation of the assessment, the actual assessment itself. People, I mean, my, I, I specialise on mental health and employment. People that were preparing to go back to work go to assessment, and their mental health deteriorates, and they go so far away from work. Yeah. Um, We've, you know, it's been widely documented that the way that assessments carried out has led to suicides. It is absolutely key that we look at the assessment process. Thank you very much. Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Kavina. So we, we've got two uh, really uh, clear proposals on the table from uh, Kirsten and from Paul, if you'll forgive me using first names, um, uh, that we should look hard, um, uh, Paul says, at the redesign of disability benefits and the rolling together of DLA, PIP and attendance allowance. And from Kirstine, um, that we should look equally hard um, at uh, the delivery and administration of disability benefits because so much of the, what I'm going to call the respect agenda, um, can be um, uh, delivered uh, through, not through entitlement, not through, you know, uh, eligibility, but through the way in which the actual interface between the user and the system uh, operates. So I have a question, if I may, Kavina, for the other four um, uh, witnesses, which is a two-part qu two, two question. One, is it possible and or desirable to disaggregate the, looking at questions of design uh, from questions of delivery? Should we try and look at them serially, or should we try and look at them together? Um, and if we, can, if, if we can't look at them together, if we have to look at, if it makes sense for this committee in your view for us to look at you know, design on the one hand and delivery on the other rather than together, which should we look at first just in terms of your advice about what you think um, this uh, committee should, should do? Is that, does that make sense? Um, Dr. Wright. Excellent question. <laughs> 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 I've done a lot of research on this myself, looking at the implementation of employment services for all sorts of groups, including disabled people, but also job seekers and including currently universal uh, credit claimants. Um, I think it's really important to look at design first and then delivery, because 
these issues can be conflated and then you get accusations, for example, that the problems are just located at implementation level, whereas in fact they're inherent in the design of the system. And I think the current debate about sanctions, for example, is a good example of that, where you hear um, criticism of Job Centre Plus staff for being very harsh, but in fact they're actually just carrying out uh, the system that's been pre-designed. So I think that I would answer your question to say, uh, serially start first with the design, but then look really carefully at how, at the, I guess, something that's in between that, the governance of the delivery. Um, so where it's easy for us in this UK context to think only in certain ways about how employment services can be delivered. And I would encourage us to look more widely to other countries to see what the different options are. So we're very used to this sort of um, path, this policy pathway in which we um, contract out, which we um, use private companies on a for-profit basis, and which we um, are really concerned with outputs and uh, outcomes in terms of job outcomes. I think in order, especially for um, people with um, health problems, capability issues, but also lone parents, for example, it's much more important to take into consideration the journey to work rather than just the, the output. And there's a lot of scope to save money, as Kirsten actually said really early on, um, and also have better services by uh, giving attention to the governance of the uh, design. Any other, one of the four that so sorry, did, I, must I must declare, I must remind the committee that uh, of my declared uh, interest in the register. I'm a, a colleague at P uh, Policy Scotland of Ken Gibb and uh, Sharon Wright. I should have declared that before I said anything. I apologise. That's, that's quite all right. Uh, anyone else want to give a comment before I bring in Alison Johnson? Uh, I, so. uh, I mean, I, I, housing benefits the benefit I, I, I know best, and I. I uh, I find it quite hard to completely disaggregate design and delivery because it seems, you know, in a sense, design determines the form of the delivery, but delivery is a necessary component to make the design work. But the thing, in the same way that, you know, uh, a lot of the benefits we're talking about here are really in the world of work and others are in the world of, of health care and, and care, uh, housing benefit has a massive impact on the way the housing system works. So it's really kind of incumbent in designers and thinkers of benefits to be really careful about the, the spillovers, the unintended consequences. So housing landlords, social housing pro pro providers, their ability to generate their rental income to term depends on how their tenants interact with the benefits uh, system, as Sharon knows very, very well. And, and, and equally, their ability to build the homes that the government has set this target of 50,000 units for critically depends on how people at lenders think the benefit system will work in the future because they have to make their lending decisions or, and providers are borrowing decisions on the, where the streams of income will come from and it heavily relies on the housing benefit system. So there's all these overlying complexities which make which probably make it quite difficult to disentangle these things and suggest maybe there's a third layer which is the, the broader world that the benefit op operates in that also has to be understood. Thank, thank, thank you. Uh, Professor Marks, you wanted to come in? Yeah, just um, going back to a couple of things that Kirsten and Sharon have said about contracting out. Contracting out has been a disaster. It has really, really damaged the way that assessments are undertaken. Um, if there is any scope to look at that, I think it's really, really important. Can I come? Thank you. Just a very, short, very yeah, just briefly, just to say um, that the international evidence backs this up that contracting out to third parties in terms of welfare delivery has been an unmitigated disaster internationally. And you have the opportunity to address that. So that would be one of your priorities, I would have said. Really, really thank, yep. thank, thank you very much. Sorry, Dr. Graham, did you want to come in on that particular one? Alison Johnson? Yeah, just a, a couple of specific questions on design and delivery, and probably the first one to Professor Rummery and then to Professor Marks um, on the second point. Um, you spoke earlier about the importance of, well, and the fact that we have this opportunity to administer the system differently. And last week we heard from Citizens Advice Bureau and then from um, those working within local job centres and um, the digital, the insistence on applying digitally seemed to be a major stumbling block for loads of people. And I think we were all fairly horrified to learn that staff in citizens' advice bureaus who have great expertise are having to spend their time giving people who would like to claim IT lessons in order to access the system. Now, that seems to me 
you know, I, I, I would suggest that as a priority that has to be fixed. So we have, you know, this sort of insistence on some people applying digitally, and then we have another assist insistence that some people have to attend unnecessary assessments in person when digitally or applying in paper, you know, or the telephone, um, I would suggest, might be a means of communication that, that we might want to look at. So I'd appreciate um, your views on that, particularly, Professor Rumi, Rumi in the first place. And then I have a question yeah. on employment programmes. It, it goes back to this um, idea of, you know, the, the design has to, uh, uh, the system has to follow what the, the, the design is intending to achieve. Now, if we are intending to achieve, and, and the base, getting the basic theoretical approaches and the basic aims of the system right to start with, we look at the evidence from community care claimants, um, the fact that they have to go through all sorts of hoops, and some of them have to apply digitally, and some of them have to apply through social services assessments, etc. and they didn't understand the system, um, and the worse, the practitioners working in the system didn't understand the system. So we're not in a place to actually support people through. Um, and your example of, of citizens' advice is, is, is absolutely salient, that um, we can get diverted from what we're actually trying to achieve by other conflicting priorities. So this move towards digi the digital economy, this move towards everything being online, because that's seen as being more administratively effective and efficient, that actually effectively cuts out a lot of people. And it doesn't necessarily simplify or make the system fairer. So it's that fairness, simplicity, and accountability that actually has to run the design of the system. Um, and just to, and in a sidebar to, to put a warning flag down about administrative savings, that does effectively mean job losses in, hopefully, people who are there to um, administer the complex system as the system gets simpler and easier, there should be more uh, resource um, made available, but that is a as a result probably of job losses to frontline workers. So that doesn't, in terms of unintended consequences, that does need to be taken into account. I, I know that uh, Dr. Graham wanted to come in. Professor Spicer, uh, I, th I think, sorry, Dr. Graham is. Dr. Graham. I think that, that illustrates really the importance of embedding user experience at every stage um, of, the, of the policy design and implementation process, because if you'd asked claimants, um, potential universal credit claimants about this before, uh, they would have, you'd, you'd have, the, the government would have known that it wasn't going to be feasible for them to, um, to all be applying online. So I think, yeah, it illustrates the importance of involving um, the people who will be affected um, at, at all stages to get their perspective as well. I'd, li I'd like to emphasise the importance of flexibility and diversity of methods. One size never fits everyone. Um, and regardless of whether it's going to be digital, or whether it's going to be telephone, or whether it's going to be face-to-face, -face, there are people for whom it will not work. In Scotland, because of the peculiar geography that we have, um, there are people who live in extremely isolated locations who cannot practically get to certain centres for certain purposes. We have got to think about this flexibly. Now, flexibly may well be, for example, that we decide to deal with issues of identification or um, offer, offering assistance through different routes. Uh, it's possible we know from passports, for teachers, doctors, bankers, and local shopkeepers to help with identification. We can do things differently. We don't have to do them the way that they are currently done by the Department for Work and Pensions. Can I also just come quickly yes. on, um, to reiterate uh, Dr. Wright's point about there is a substantial amount of information in the system already, particularly in the health system that we are not using. We are not using doctors effectively. We are not using, because we're wasting money going to third party assessors who are just replicating what has, the work that has already been done and probably done more effectively and more user-centeredly than the work that is done by outsourcing. So, you know, any system design has got to use the expertise of the people in it. Um, and the people already in it who are, who are already working with this group of people. And to go back to the point about it's also got to be centred on the user experience. And I'm really, really welcome that the whole process of, of designing um, a potential bill is also drawing on users' experience, because I think that is absolutely key. They will tell you 
what works. They are an extremely efficient way of designing a system that um, as long as you get, uh, you know, just to reiterate, as long as you get the theory and the actually intended aims right and you get the user perspective right and you get that governance level right, then you know, you, you're, you're saving yourself a lot of hassle and you're actually being able to achieve your aims of independence and, and all of those things, dignity and respect for all citizens, not just benefit claimants, because this will have kind of repercussions throughout the welfare system. If you can create something that is more accountable, more fair, um, it will have much more universal buy-in and it will Come, move away from some of the really damaging distancing effects that we've had between this theoretical distance between people who pay into the system and people who pay out of the system and all of that. You would actually start to address some of those deep cultural issues as well. Thank you. Sign point, because it's, it's very important for both design and delivery, it's, and it's a general point. Um, there are two large failings we've seen repeatedly in benefits over the last 40 years. The first has been the use of extensive portmanteau unified benefits to cover everything. When they go wrong, it is catas catastrophic for claimants. There is an alternative which is to go for smaller, better defined benefits. Benefits in the, uh, what, what matters for benefits is what's called the income package. There's a substantial comparative literature on this, the way that benefits are put together. There are countries which offer lots of little benefits rather than one big benefit, which has been the great vice of the British system. But benefits are what, in the technical term, they're called fungible. They can be mixed together. Uh, if it, money is money, so money can be added to money. The important thing is that those benefits arrive on the same day, not that they're all administered to the same rules and the same terms. And if you look, for example, at the French system, it's full of little benefits which get added together in different ways and which arrive in the same account on the same day. Um, thank you very much. Alison, do you want to come back in then? Um, yes, I, I, I'd like to um, ask Professor Marks um, just for her views on employability programmes. They're going to be devolved, um, in my own view, with a monstrous great cut, but we are going to be able to implement them in Scotland. And... You know, also, um, I, I don't think they're particularly successful. I realise that some are more successful than others, but, you know, your comments there regarding those um, with mental health issues being pushed further away from work rather than towards it, I think were quite pertinent. Could you perhaps um, just clarify what you think we could do here to make sure that the employ employability programmes are something people want to attend? Um, you know, thankfully, we're not going to... We're going to have the option to not implement sanctions with regard to them, but how could they work better and who do you think should be delivering them? Um, it shouldn't be the people that are currently delivering them. Um, <laughs> again, a contracting out issue. Um, I can give you a slightly convoluted answer to this. I originally started a project looking at the experience of people with mental health pro problems who had had their benefits changed and were expected to start seeking work. Um, I did a massive search and we found very few people because, as we've shown from the evidence earlier, very few people actually ended up in that situation. Those people that we spoke to that had been on employment programmes or employability programmes didn't find them particularly useful. They were quite patronising, assuming people that... Had, there's the assumptions made that people had never been in work or had little work experience, um, offering very basic skills that were not necessarily appropriate to people. I think there's a lack of an acknowledgement that people have been in work, have, a, have employability skills, um, and oh, the whole system works against employability. I think there's um, more of a role for the voluntary sector? Absolutely. I think the way it's delivered... I mean, I've spoken to people in one of the current providers of the work programme um, in terms of management and people that are delivering it, um, and in terms of talking to them, it's not working. Um, when you have such clear financial incentives for people delivering employability programmes, it is not going to work, and it doesn't work. But I think that is almost the second stage. The first stage is getting the system right. People's employability is being damaged by the system. You've got to get people in the right place that they can then go through the, those programmes. At the moment, those programmes aren't going to work because of 
the whole process is getting to that point. Gordon Dunter, do you want to come in in the back of that one? And then Follow up, Professor Spiker, you talked about the, the French system and having a system where there's lots of little benefits added together. I'm just wondering how that sits with your earlier comments that we need a, a simple system for people to access. I think that we've, we have suffered from the delusion in, in Britain that if we stick together a number of benefits, for example, sticking together, um, for, for, for sake of argument, tax credits, income support, housing benefit, uh, job seekers allowance, employment and support allowance, that it will somehow be simpler. It won't be. What we will actually have are a number of benefits stuck together. Um, we already have common terms across a large number of benefits. What you get by doing this, by putting it together in a package, is ending up with a very complicated package. Supplementary benefit was the same, unified housing benefit um, was the same. Um, it is, it, uh, it, we're not simplifying by pretending that the different elements of the benefits are the same. The same, I'm, I'm afraid, is true in relation to something like DLA with care component and mobility component, which is why I suggested earlier that these might sensibly be separated out. Uh, we can do, it's not actually, what, what the main difference is that yes, you have uh, a longer form for some people, but actually what we're doing at the moment is requiring everybody to fill in the longer form in case and there are a large number of people for whom it means that they get deeply inappropriate, intrusive personal questions being asked that do not belong to the circumstances that they're dealing with. Polly uh, McNeil. Thank you. Um, well, it's been extremely helpful so far and a lot to take in. Um, but it certainly helped shape my mind in terms of what this, this committee could usefully do. I have um, two questions, convener. One's a quick question um, to Kirsten um, about the question of assessment. I've been of the view for a long time that it should be run by, uh, it should, it should be run by the state. It shouldn't be run by the private sector. However, I just wanted to be clear, um, the targets that you talked about, which are, are, are set and the framework for assessment, um, is that one of the reasons why the assessments are going so badly wrong? So it's not just a question of who runs it, it's a question of what, what framework is, is around it too. Um, absolutely. Um, and the, if, if you have top-down targets around income, about um, reduction in, in spent, which is what has driven a lot of this, not just in benefits, but also in community care and in other sectors, um, then you have, um, you know, kind of frontline practitioners trying to square the circle of A, reduction in resources, and they're acting as rationers, as rationing agents to access those resources. But at the same time, they're trying to facilitate uh, and help the people that they're actually there to help. I would take issue with it has to be the state. I think the voluntary sector would also play quite an important part in this because we do know that a lot of user expertise um, is actually located in the voluntary sector. And if we look at the example for ex uh, that I know a lot about, which is self-directed support, when you have advocacy agencies that are actually working, uh, 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 employing disabled people themselves, people who've used self-directed support who understand the system and can help people, um, that would f form, I think, an important part of, uh, of you know, the people that would be involved in... in um, administering these kinds of things. I wouldn't discount the voluntary sector, but what I would discount, I, and, and, but contracting in not in a for-profit basis, contracting to deliver a certain set of advocacy or support functions, etc., that are perhaps better delivered by the third sector than they are by the state. But I would not contract out um, with targets, and, and um, particularly around income targets, um, because that is where it has gone wrong. That is where it's gone really, really badly wrong. Even, you know, for-profit agencies who have the best will in the world to try and actually achieve the, the intended outcomes for the people that they're assessing cannot operate if they are actually the overriding, what, what we would call in policy terms, the deep normative core is actually about saving money. Um, and this is why it's important to get the aim. So that must be values. also the key proviso then, that you have to remove the target to just expenditure yes. you're assessing people or at least on whether take it somewhere else answer. in the system so it's not driving the frontline practitioners great wanted to give in that particular one um, yeah, but it's also the 
it ends the earlier question about uh, employment services, the points are connected. So um, there are several countries that have co contracted out employment services, um, mainly the US, Australia, Denmark, Germany to some extent, and then also the UK ourselves. We've got quite a history of that now, especially since the late 1990s. Um, but if you look at each of those countries and the um, vast quantities of evidence that's uh, come from evaluation of the programmes, there's almost no evidence at all that that process has met the main aims, which are in all of those countries, to save money, um, to reduce bu bureaucracy, to uh, have a simpler system, um, or to provide users with choice. Um, so although there's a lot of political drive towards contracting out services, whoever they're contracted out to, and sometimes, for example, um, in Germany and Denmark, it could be contracted out to uh, local municipalities, so it could be contracted into local forms of government rather than to private companies. Um, there's very little evidence at all. There's a small amount of evidence in Australia, but very little evidence that has any of those desired effects. So if you're thinking about uh, money and saving money, it could be that um, stopping contracting out saves the money, reduces bureaucracy and gives users more choice or enhances the experience for users. But the picture is not that straightforward. So what we also know is that there are some... Uh, qualitative benefits to contracting out, even in the use of the private sector. So although there are uh, very big problems with output payments, also with transaction costs, the whole um, costly process of issuing the tender, all of the time and energy that each of those potential contractors puts into delivering those tenders, the time and energy to consider them all, all of those transaction costs are very um, important. Um, but there is some evidence that uh, private companies can engage with users in a more respectful way than, for example, Job Centre Plus. So the question here is, how will the Scottish Social Security Agency engage with people and how would people delivering employability services ensure that they can be respectful. So it's one thing saying we want dignity and respect in the system. I think um, even in DWP, even in the, uh, but I'm sure in the private providers, NGS for example, and the work, other work programme providers, they don't set out to treat people disrespectfully. Um, but it happens because of the framework, as you pointed out, the pos because of the framework that people are operating within. Um, so what does you know enhance a good experience. I did some research um, a few years ago. It was small scale, but we asked people what um, what was important to them. And they said um, it was about being listened to and being taken seriously. Um, people said they wanted uh, flexible appointments, uh, long appointments, practical help with things like form filling, the sorts of things that CABs are doing with the online help. Um, now, in my current study, um, people want help with appeals and mandatory reconsiderations as well. So if there's some scope to include that, that would also enhance take-up, which would also bring more money into Scotland. So the, that level, that interface is really important, how people are treated and being listened to. And actually, I would go beyond dignity and respect and say what we actually need is compassion and empathy to aim higher and then maybe actually achieve dignity and respect. On, on Shortly, and then Pauline McNeil back again. Sorry, if you could just be quite brief, because we're running oh, out of time. I've got another Two situation. things about contracting out. The first is it matters what you contract out. Um, the, for example, the pension service contracts out to the, I believe to Royal Mail, the process of opening the envelopes in the morning. Uh, that is not problematic in the way that many of the other arrangements have been. So that matters. The second thing that is deeply problematic is subcontracting, which has been used particularly in relation to employability. There have been a number of government reports on subcontracting, where basically the, the fundamental problem is that the departments um, that are responsible lose control at the point where it goes from a main contractor to a subcontractor. Thank you very much for that point, Paul McNeill. Yep, yeah, my second question, and that's really helpful, but it does bring you back to this, the question that Adam Tompkins raised, which is about the detail of the design. So this is my, my second question. Um, now, I thought it was interesting that Kirsten described the, the powers that we're going to have. It was really just a lump sum that can be organised any way you want. 
And you're the first person to, to, to put it like that, and I thought that was quite interesting. Um, but that does mean that it's quite a huge task if you're going to redesign something and, and treat it as if, well, we're, we're, there's a lump sum of money, let's decide what kind of benefits, whether they're smaller benefits, and a system that applies this whole question of dignity and so on and accessibility. So I suppose my question is, where do we start with this? Because as Adam Tompkins says in his contribution, we have to deliver a service first. Now, the Scottish Government have announced they're not going to take the powers till 2020. We haven't examined that yet. Um, but anything you'd like to tell the committee about, where do you start then? You really, really have to start now, you would think, in terms of planning a new design to incorporate all the elements. And some of the elements that have been talked about, that Alison Johns talks about, but the way that people contact the service is important. The advocacy within the service is important. These are all going to be costly measures, ones which I would support, but I imagine there are costs attached to that, although you can strip away some of that. I just wonder, um, do, do you think we've got the capacity to do it? Where, does, where is the capacity? Um, any thoughts at all you have, uh, I think would be really, really helpful, because it seems to me, from what I've heard this morning, that's where we really need to get into the nitty-gritty of the detail of if we were going to design a system, where do we start? Who's going to help us do that? How do we start to establish the cost to create something? And when can we think about saying, well, this is, this is the point at which we can launch such a new system? Who, who wants to come in on that one? And I must say, you know, we have another questioner as well. So if possible, it would be quite brief answers, please, uh, Dr. Wright. I think the first place to start would be to get advice from other countries that have had similar systems so maybe not at such a, a dramatic juncture point but there are other countries that are small countries like Scotland is countries that have even countries like Slovenia much smaller but um, after uh, the end of socialism set up uh, its own employment services so these are these tensions will never disappear but there are other countries that are doing a really good job of these things I don't think it's cheap so there is the question of whether taxes are raised to, to help cover it. But a good uh, analysis of the costs and benefits would be important at this stage because there would be savings as well as extra costs. Thank you. Uh, Dr Speicher. Uh, well, two immediate traps. One is the zero-sum game. If you start off with a fixed budget, then I'm afraid you cannot make anybody better off in the system without making somebody else worse off. A uh, simple matter of mathematics, and almost every improvement will cost more. The second thing is that in terms of administrative capacity, we do have a large experience of moving um, benefits to new agencies, and the result has been a series of unqualified administrative fiascos. Uh, we've seen it, for example, in the transfer of responsibility from um, uh, the uh, Department for Social Security to local authorities for housing benefit. We saw it again in the transfer of responsibilities to HMRC. We're seeing it now with universal credit and the transfer of certain responsibilities back from HMRC to Job Centre Plus, who have never dealt, for example, with housing queries for, for, for years, and the expertise has all been lost. Um, we're, we're going to hit the buffers one way or another, and it's, I'm afraid what's necessary to do is to plan a certain amount of overcapacity in the confident expectation it will not be enough. Thank you. Anyone else want to come in with any observations? Okay. I know Ruth Maguire wants to come in the back. Oh, sorry, Professor Gibb, did you want to come? You want to come in the back of that, and then it's... A very forward. quick supplementary convener. Um, Dr Wright, I wonder <coughs> where else in the world there is an example of a country that's taken 15% out of a system that's built up over decades and, and made it work and, and how we can, we can learn from that. I know it's a tricky position, but there are other countries that have had a big role in designing their own employability services in Europe and Central and Eastern Europe, but also... So, because I think the thing we have to remember is that a lot of the people that are going to use our um, social security system, they're still going to be reliant on the DWP. So we can't, 
Although, you know, we'll do our very best to make it <laughs> very different from that. It mm. still has to talk to the other system. I know, it's a tricky business. But there is more experience of that than you think, because the UK has traditionally been much more centralised than almost mm. any other country in the world. So most countries are far more familiar with dealing yeah. with multiple levels of government. So if you even look to Australia, for example, a lot more is decided at regional level. In Germany, a lot in yeah. the Scandinavian countries, there's actually a lot of things that are designed decided at municipal level. So actually, a lot of countries have experience of um, operating national programmes alongside regional programmes. You, want to thank you. you wanted to come in, and it's George Adam. The, the Netherlands has actually just devolved um, a portion of its um, social security functions to the local level. Um, I couldn't put a percentage on it for you right now. Um, but that's something that they that the municipalities really have um, grasped with both hands. And so now you've got, for example, the city of Utrecht, which is running a basic income experiment, and other cities trying to do likewise, I think. And I think with the, the, the capacity to create you know, discretionary benefits or something, then the, there is the potential for innovation um, uh, in, in that respect. And it's, it's maybe an example that you could look to. Thank you very much. Uh, George Asen, we've got roughly about six minutes. Thank you, convener. <laughs> I'll try and use up all that time then. Uh, no, I won't. Uh, basically, uh, I would like to ask about uh, DLA PIP uh, and the fact that we've had evidence come to the committee where, in fact, Disability Agenda Scotland and their written evidence said improvements need to be made, but in a well-managed way, taking time to get things right. So there seems to be a, a belief out there that it's a case of getting the system correct, you know, make sure we get it properly. And when we're talking about, look, my colleague Ben McPherson said about secure transfer of powers, you know, we have to make sure there's no big red button that we're going to press and everything's going to kind of magically happen and money will appear in our bank accounts overnight. You know, so I think, uh, is it not the case that this is the biggest challenge, but at the same time, it's probably one of the most important things is to make sure we get the system work. Because you've already said how flawed various things have been over the years, because there's been knee-jerk reactions or policy decisions by uh, in, in government. So is it not just the case that it's the biggest challenge, but we need to take the time to get it right? Who wants to go first on that particular one? Uh, um, Mr. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yes, it's the biggest challenge. You can approach it in an incremental way. As you said, there's not a big button that has to go for them and we have suddenly have a massively wonderful but completely different system because we know from the experience of policy change that that doesn't work. That just creates an awful lot of instability in the system. Mm. Um, you have new claimants. That would be where I would start is... is radically change the PIP system to be fairer, more accountable, and actually achieve what it wants to achieve, what you want it to achieve, not the flawed theoretical basis that it's been set up on. And then you can transfer old DLA claimants onto the new system, bearing in mind that you don't want people who've got lifetime awards to have to go through reassessment. But you can, you know, you've got a relatively smallish uh, population in which to start piloting that new system and redesigning it so that it's fairer before you transfer um, people along. And it can be done in an incremental way, but I would also reiterate that, you know, look not just widely in terms of international evidence, but also within um, evidence that looks at systematic change. Because getting the values right and getting the aims right for the systematic change enables all of the components to actually come together. That's what you actually have to spend, you know, the next really, really focus on that, because the design will follow. And there are examples internationally that you can draw on of, of complex systems, of multi-level governance, so you could be involving local authorities. Um, in some of this. I would hesitate to say that and don't introduce um, inequities in, into the system because you don't want claimants in Clack Manninshire being entitled to a completely different set of welfare benefits than claimants in Stirling because that's already one of the problems inherent. But you can pilot things and you can test things and you can draw on academic evidence. You've got 16 world-class universities in Scotland. You know, Use us to help you design the system. Dr Wright, you wanted to come in on this particular one? I just wanted to uh, make a bit of a facetious comment, and that was that in terms of the employability programmes, um, there's so much that's been done either very poorly or not done at all because the system's more or less a self-help system now. People find themselves jobs, um, whether they're um, attached to Job Centre Plus at the time or whether they're attached to a, a provider of an employment programme, um, that it's almost impossible for you to go wrong in some respects because whatever you do has <laughs> got to be better. <laughs> Did you want to go back in? 
Yeah, it was just, it's another very practical question uh, in so much as uh, we all know the system itself. Again, the big red button's not there. And the system itself is made up of numerous computer systems that don't talk to one another. And, uh, and government's great at dealing with computer systems, as we all know. Uh, and also we have, in some cases, it's actual manual archive of uh, individuals. Now, if I was a minister, I would be wanting to go down and pick up every single bit of that paperwork to make sure that nobody got lost uh, when we're going out. Now, that's time consuming in itself. That's difficult. And what would, you, would your advice be in kind of trying to traverse that uh, kind of the landscape? Who would like to come in on that one? Professor Speaker, did you want to come in on that? Well, I, Quite briefly, we've got two it's, minutes left. It's, it's hard to resist the invitation to come in about information technology. It's been one of the curses of the benefit system, has been the, the idea that somewhere there is an all singing, all dancing computer program which will solve all of our problems and be able to respond to everything and return information. Uh, it has never worked, it's never been possible to do it. Rather, what we need to do with computers is to use them with what they're good at, which which is the routine iteration of functions which can be dealt with automatically. Even now within universal credit, they're using four computer systems and they're relying a lot on manual workarounds, if truth be known. Um, we have to accept that the only way to deal with this is to make sure that there is some process whereby all the information can be reviewed and that usually means somewhere there has to be a human being. I think uh, human beings are a very fine way to finish this session, as it is about uh, people, uh, not about computers, academics, or even politicians. It's about the people who, obviously, you mentioned the word welfare a lot, obviously, because it comes up, but, you know, I prefer social security, because it is something to secure people's lives rather than wanting welfare, which is a word we, we try not to use in the Scottish Parliament, but we have to, obviously, with the powers that's coming forward. Hopefully, when the new Social Security Bill comes in, that will be embedded in, in, in people's minds. Can I just say thank you very much for, for turning up and coming along today. The evidence session has been really, really good. I think we've picked up a lot from it, and we may call on your services again. Um, hopefully, that you'll be free to come along. So I close this meeting. We've agreed to take the next item in private, so I formally close the meeting and thank you once again for coming along. Thank you.